Our text this morning comes from the fifth chapter of John. It's a story of a man by the pool of Bethesda. It's a story I referred to last week in the sermon, and we will unpack it a little further this morning. Hear the word of God. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porticos. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay in the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, do you, he asked him, do you want to be well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one put, to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets ahead of me. Jesus told him, Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath, so the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, You can't walk on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, The man who healed me told me, Pick up your mat and walk. Who said such thing as that, they demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd, but afterward Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well, so stop sinning, or something even worse may happen to you. And the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who healed him. May God add his understanding to this hearing of his word. Well, you'll be surprised to know I went to Starbucks this morning. <clears throat> Interesting. I sat down, and I always go over my notes before as my final moment of preparation. And I looked up, and I saw a man, and I thought, it can't be. And then I listened to, I could hear his voice, and he spoke. It was Phil Donahue. Donahue was at the Starbucks up on uh, Vanderbilt Beach. And uh, so I, I thought, this is really interesting. And he had bedhead hair, you know, and all of that. He was in jeans. And, but um, it was really nice to see him. And so I went up to him afterwards and told him I missed his show and appreciated him. And uh, he thanked me. I asked him if he missed it. He said, he said, the daily grind was so hard, day in, day out, was so very difficult. But I thought, how fascinating. What a great place we live in, to have people show up and, um, uh, and have an opportunity to speak to him. Nobody else spoke to him. So I thought, being a minister. <laughs> Well, unrelated to any of that, I just wanted to share that with you, but um, <clears throat> in preparation for the sermon this morning, I thought back to the very first church I was, that I pastored as an associate in Southern California, a place called Laverne. It was right next to Claremont, where the Claremont College is, this beautiful college town. And there was this guy who rode around on his bike going from church to church to church every single week at, to different churches. Didn't hit all the churches in one week, but you know, he made the rounds. By, by the end of the month, we had, we'd see Stephen. He'd come in and um, see if we had anything for him. Some cards, you know, some uh, grocery for the grocery store, for the gas station, or anything at all. So he, he kept coming in and we always kind of said, well, not this week, not now. And, um, and then he had also, he was, he was uh, non-discriminatory. He also went to the temple and um, hit them up and went to the Catholics and hit them up. And, and then, then, oddly enough, one Saturday uh, morning at the temple in, in uh, Claremont, some of the people came in and asked the rabbi, since when did we start charging to park in our parking lot? <laughs> Stephen was out in the parking lot charging people five bucks to park in the parking lot to, to go to the synagogue that morning. And I thought, you know, what a goofball. We got one of those guys here in town, a guy named Lewis. I see him all the time. He's always on his bike. And 
I saw him one time, he tried to hit me up, he, he's, he's uh, uh, Greek Orthodox, I think, he always comes and kisses my hand, and, and I finally said, Louis, get a job. <laughs> There are signs out in front of Best Buy and Home Depot. Get a job. You're, you're young enough, strong enough, smart enough. Get yourself a job. Go to work. And he, he never kissed my hand again. <laughs> so Jesus goes to the Pool of Bethesda. This is in Jerusalem. And it is a place where all kinds of people are there waiting for the bubbling of the water because there's apparently a story about the fact that when that water bubbles, that's an angel that's touched the water and the first end of the water gets healed. And Jesus sees a man who's been there for 38 years. And when he sees him, and Jesus never asks an innocent question. He said, do you want to be well? And the immediate response was for him to blame the system. Well, I don't have anyone to put me in the pool and somebody always gets into the pool before I do. For 38 years. And the interesting use of the Greek in this case is that he was in his sickness for 38 years. The implication of the language is that that sickness owns him. He allowed his sickness to define him, his paralysis to define him. And he, not unlike Stephen, or unlike Lewis, had adapted and adjusted and was working the system. Because he had to eat, he had to live, and so it was by that pool that so many were not just waiting to be healed, but they were also there to get gifts from people. And so he, in response to Jesus who sees him, and he blames the system for his inability to, to get healed. Jesus says to him, and I believe he's terse. I believe that the tone of Jesus, although that can't be fully recovered except in the larger context of this passage, I believe his tone is terse. Pick up your bed and walk. Get a job. Take responsibility for yourself. Quit blaming. Quit blaming and gaming. Let's face it, there's always a system. There's always something. Michael Katz, who was a, he just passed away about a year and a half ago, wrote about poverty and and he identified the primary cause for poverty, particularly among American blacks, as the system. Following Reconstruction and then American systemic racism and, and that whole argument. And then Charles Murray has come out with a counter argument because he does an analysis of poverty in America but identifies primarily or, or exclusively to begin with white America. And Charles Murray demonstrates that the contours of poverty in white America parallel the contours of poverty for African Americans as, for, as well as for Hispanics. There's no significant statistical difference between the two. And in one case, Michael Katz blames systemic racism. Charles Murray blames the breakdown of the family and the growth of the entitlement system in the United States. But the point is there's always a system. There's always something. And 
Well, we lost yesterday playing basketball. I coached, and um, my team has won so many, so many uh, championships, and we just got shellacked. And we had a good, good players, but we just couldn't put it together. We lost to a very inf inferior team. And it's okay because basketball athletics is a meritocracy. You win by playing well, playing better than the others. And there are always refs, there's always a system. Some refs are good and some are not so good, but whatever the system that you're playing within, you always have to play within that reality. And bear with me. The NBA is over 70% African American. Does that mean it is racist? Does that mean the system is favoring African Americans? Perhaps when Chris Rock gets up in front of the Academy Awards and makes statements about racism, maybe the better response, rather than to blame the system, would be for these great African American actresses and actresses to sit down with one another and say, we've got to dig deeper. We've got to try harder. We didn't get any this time. We've got to work harder to make a difference. We've got to pick up our beds and walk. We have to dig deep. We have to try harder. Systemic realities are always there. But notice the religious system of the first century. Those religious authorities were upset at this man for walking and for carrying his mat. For some reason there is an interest in maintaining a little bit of pathology in their midst because the pathology of people makes them dependent on the system. So for someone to get well is actually a confrontation of the system. And that can't be good if it means that I, who might be a guardian of the system, have less power than I did before. And so they grill him. Who did this? Who told you to do this? But Jesus, Jesus knows. There's always something. There's always some reason why. There's always some reason why not. We all, all of us, every single person has some reason that, that, that life is difficult. That opportunities are closed off. There's always something. And yet Jesus says to us, it's harder for us to change. It's, it's so much harder to change than to blame. It's so much easier to identify something outside of ourselves as the reason. Rather than taking a good hard look at self and saying, what must I do to make a difference in my own life and to make a difference in the lives of others around us. Now this is not to say that all poverty is self-inflicted, not at all. We know there are hard realities in our economy and the exporting of jobs all over the world as well as the increase of technology, all of this has had devastating effects on, on, the, on the job market. And we know that for at least a decade now, average salaries and incomes have remained the same or gone down in some cases. And even now, our unemployment figures include all kinds of minimum wage jobs and people working many, two, three part-time jobs. So we know that there's a reality, there's a reality to people having a hard time. That's, that's just how life is presenting itself to, to so many in our time. And we are in no way, as a people, 
as a church relieved of responsibility simply because there may be instances, there are instances of self-inflicted impoverishment. Guys like Stephen and guys like Lewis. We always have the poor with us, Jesus says to us. That means we always have a responsibility. Always. We're never relieved of that responsibility. But as this story turns on us and towards us, we are, we are in a place where we must acknowledge that we too are so good at putting blame outside of ourselves. We are so good at scapegoating this and that. My kids yesterday were scapegoating one particular referee. So there are always refs, some good, some bad. It doesn't matter. And, and so the, the word to Jesus is always to us personally. And the Lord, the Lord comes to us and he says to us, what must you do? What must you do? It doesn't mean we're lifted out of poverty. It doesn't mean that, that we get what we want. But it does mean that we live responsibly. And that we live with the dignity of knowing that God has given us capabilities. God has given us strength and intelligence and, and wherewithal. And that we can draw upon the gifts that God has given to us. So when Jesus says to this man, pick up your bed and walk, we hear those words and we apply those words in our own lives at different times and we know when we need to do it. We need to pick up and keep going to the glory of our God who has given us work as a gift, as a means of dignity, as a means to demonstrate that we are co-creators with him. Will you bow with me in prayer? And O oh Lord, that you would entrust your entire creation to us. That the plan of redemption might be worked out in and through us. That we might be called to be stewards of this life and given opportunity to serve in ways that many of us would never dream. Oh Lord, we ask that in those instances where we personally know we ought, may we pick up our beds and walk. We ask it in the name of your Son. Amen.